Okay, so today's topic is, well, about the questions about if there is a philosophy of technology. I got asked these questions on a conference where I were. Um, it was a robotics conference um, held by the Lutheran theologians in Tutzing in Bavaria. And I was delighted to hear that theologians also think about this type of questions. I was unaware of that. I thought that, well, theolo theologians generally um, think about theology, but they seem to be very interested in that topic and um, asked, uh, asked me to, to give a, um, a presentation on um, robotics there. And so I, yeah, well did. And during the, one of the conversations I had with uh, colleagues there, the question came up whether or not there is a philosophy of technology. And one colleague who is from uh, Italy said that in Italy, they were starting a new journal, a philosophical journal about techno philosophy. And the first issue was, is there a philosophy of technology? And I love this question because it's similar to ethics. Usually a lot of the questions apparently seem to be simple and easy to answer, but once you, you've thought about it for some time, um, you realize that it is not that simple and easy uh, to, to do. It's a complicated question and it's not easy to answer. So I wrote um, a paper on that. So my argumentation started with, there is hmm, quite a bit of drive in me. It's um, seductive, I would say, to say, yeah, of course there is a philosophy of technology. And there are lots of publications, books and papers on technology philosophy. So. Um, what's the word again? Uh, there's a big temptation to, to just say, yeah, sure. And uh, then just stop talking about it. Since there are a lot of texts that say there are the philosophy of technology, but it, it's not that easy, I would say, or like we philosophers like to do, we, we like to, to take seemingly simple and easy things and make them really complicated. <laughs> And, and for good reason, I would say. So first of all, uh, we should talk about what is philosophy, by the way. Um, and it's, um, it's hard to, to find a universal definition of the word. And that's the reason why I um, said, okay, we use a working definition. We use a definition that works for this argumentation, but has no does not want to be universal or does not pretend to be universal. So we go from etymology. We started etymology and in uh, Greek, philos means friend and sophos means wisdom. And in ancient Greek philosophy, um, there was this idea that was going around that humans could never be wise. Humans could never see the truth. Only the gods can truly be wise. And only the gods could know the truth about the world. So thus they started, they coined the term of philosophy. That means the friendship to wisdom, the attempt to become wise, although it's impossible, but still you can attempt it and it's your duty to become as wise or as close to wisdom as possible. And that's philosophy. So I would say that I use this as the definition for philosophy. And the next question then I had was, what's wisdom? And also here, we cannot find a universally accepted definition, but I would say that wisdom is the attempt to relate to the truth. And the truth is, if we, well, also we don't know really what, what truth is. So um, truth would be the attempt to state whether or not a statement is correct or not. Like 
it's raining or it's not raining. And if it indeed rains where I am, it is true when I say it's raining. It is accurate. It reflects the reality accurately. And that's my working definition for truth. And wisdom is the attempt to relate to what is true. That's what I would say um, is wisdom. And again, you will find like a whole bunch of philosophers who say that, well, no, in that case, uh, in that case truth needs an observer. Yeah, um, that is also being debated, especially from my very, very good friends, the postmodernists, which I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if I can use these words in a lecture. But anyway, um, no, the truth does not need an observer because things happen even if not, they are not observed, because we can see the consequences of what happens. That's the thing. Like the, one of the philosophical questions is if um, a tree falls in the forest, nobody's there to hear it, is there a sound? Well, there is nobody to hear it, but that doesn't mean that the mechanics that produce sound are just switched off. And the mechanics, vibrations of material and air, they happen whether or not somebody is there to, to experience it. So of course, there is a sound, although you can't hear it. And that's important to know if we look at the past, the very uh, at the uh, long gone past, things have happened. Doesn't matter that nobody is is, um, is still alive um, to 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 remember it. But things still have happened. Um, this is my position, by the way, and you'll find um, others whom I'm I'm reluctant to call philosophers uh, to say uh, otherwise. Uh, there are lots of others, which is. Um, a big step backwards, I believe. But anyway, <clears throat> so the, my argumentation um, continues. Um, all sciences uh, search for the truth mm -hmm. or what I've um, described as the, the word truth meaning. Um, natural sciences, well, look for the truth in nature like physics, chemistry, and so on. Um, the philosophy seeks for the truth within thought and engineering sciences look for it in the possible. And technology de technological development is a, a continuous process which not always has an inherent moral question or a question uh, about the consequences. So a techno philosophy would combine the questions for the possible with questions for the necessity of doing it. So there have been a lot of old, very old, um, yeah, thoughts and books and writings about this topic. Now we ask, whom does philosophy belong to? Um, in ancient Greece, they knew that, well, ideas was called enthusiasmus, enthusiasm. And that means to be, to be, um, um, not possessed, but yeah, to be somehow possessed by the gods. In their view, in old Greek um, uh, philosophy and mythology, humans cannot have ideas. In old Greece, the philosophers thought that the gods would give ideas into the soul of a human. And those gods or spiritual beings were called 
Musai, the muses. And there were several muses for all kinds of, um, well, artistic and engineering things. And by the way, the Musai is also the word where music comes from. So where does I do ideas come from? If you ask the ancient Greeks, well, they come from the gods or the spiritual beings. We, I don't know if it's really God or the gods or whatever um, maybe you believe in, but that doesn't matter because all that, those, this enthusiasmus, this enthusiasmus, this enthusiasm, this being possessed by a god needs to do really well is techne. Um, and that's the ancient Greek word for, well, the ability to craftfully do something. That's the basics for the word, word technology. And the ancient Greek did not clearly, not with, at least not with that word, clearly distinguish between the arts, the crafts and technology and philosophy and sciences. There was one thing and that was technology. So that is an indicator for the, for the possibility that there is a philosophy of technology. Well, next about mathematics and the theology of technology. You may have heard, quite certainly have heard uh, about the philosopher Pythagoras. And Pythagoras was a great thinker. He was the first rationalist. And Pythagoras, Pythagoras's goal was to find the basic harmonies of the world. He literally tried to figure out what the gods think. You know the Pythagorean theorem, which was not from Pythagoras, actually. Um, it was known uh, by the ancient Egyptians about a thousand years before Pythagoras was born, in about 570-something BC. So Pythagoras really tried to figure out what are the basic harmonies of the world. He did not believe in irrational numbers. And now we know that there are irrational, irrational numbers. And actually we know that there are infinitely more irrational numbers than rational ones. I mean, obviously since any rational number being multiplied with an irrational one gives an irrational one. <laughs> and one of his critics was called Hippasos of Metapont. And he somehow figured out that um, the square root of two is a um, irrational number. I don't remember exactly how he did it, but he did it. And the next day he was found dead on the shore of a river. Mm. There is no mm, evidence that Pythagoras or his students were involved in that, but it doesn't seem so far-fetched to me. Yeah, there was a <laughs> philosophy even at the, in the ancient times was a cutthroat business. Well, it still is, but well, that was literally cutthroat, literally. <laughs> oh man. But anyway, um, Pythagoras believed that everything there is could be expressed, expressed in finite ratios, in finite rationalities. And this worldview did not allow for the, well, irrational to exist. Um, that's rationalism, by the way. And he figured out that if you mount a string on a board and pluck it, and then divide it in certain um, ratios, you find harmony in that. And that's how he believed, he and his students believed, that's how to figure out the basic harmonies of the world. What he really did was, well, seminally or foundationally create, well, I would say, European music theory. The Pythagorean tuning is not perfect. 
um, but it still works. And if you use it and tune your piano or your guitar in a Pythagorean manner, you would have a light, slightly strange sounding um, instrument, but it still would work. So that was the idea. And what sounds harmonic, for instance, is not really a question of perception, it's a question of physics. I mean, the octave, one of the most clear harmonies there are, is represented by the number two to one or one to two, depending on how way, uh, which way you see it. And that's the doubling of the frequency. And of course, you know from physics that if you double the frequency and play both at the same time, it works harmonically. And out of that, he figured out a, a whole um, harmonic system. And that's quite, quite great, I would say. And the interesting thing is, this music theory Pythagoras started is based on physics, but was inspired by theological thought. And that's quite interesting, I would say. My doctorate mentor, Batson Brock, and the great philosopher Peter Bible, um, where they call this techno theology. That's kind of something, I would say. So yeah, from this perspective, I would say there is a um, philosophy of technology. Now, medicine and technology, um, it's also a thing that's quite well, that's part of my professional life. In uh, 1748, uh, there was a philosopher called Julien Offray de la Maitrie, and he published a book called L'Homme Machine, the human as a machine, or the machine called human. And in this book, he represented humans as machines with parts and forces and uh, inter intricate systems. And that was extremely important because, well, at the time and long before, human, the human body was considered something sacred, something untouchable, something that cannot be, uh, or that, that by deliberately hurting it can be sacrilege. And de la Maitrie, however, well described it as a machine. And that's quite something I would say. And we're not trying to say here that there is nothing, definitely nothing holy or nothing sacred uh, in the human body. It's not my intention to counteract any uh, philosophical or theological or re religious beliefs. But the machine view on the human body is exceptionally important in the creation of a modern medicine. Because only if you can see that an aspect of what a human body is, is a machine, only then can you develop medicine and surgery, for instance. Like if you thought about um, the human body as a machine, you could also realize that if something is broken, it may be repaired. If you have broken a bone, for instance, it's possible to repair it. If you get deadly ill, there is a re there is possibly a way to either fix it or at least make your life a little bit more bearable with the disease. And that is only possible, I would say, if you would accept that an aspect of what the human body is, is a machine. I'm not saying that's all it is. I'm saying that's an aspect of what it is. To do a surgery needs formidable techne, formidable technique. Doing surgery is difficult. And these thoughts, human as a machine, medicine and technology, they are also an indicator that there may be a philosophy of technology. And be aware that 
every hospital that I know of has an ethics committee. So um, doctors, when they if they want to keep their licenses, they cannot just do whatever they want with you. They have to adhere to the ethical standards of the ethics committee and to the common practices of medicine. And if they don't, the risk is high that they would least lose their um, their license. So the human body is not only a machine, but part of what it is, is a machine. Now, about art and technology, there is, well, there's a lot of writing, especially in the beginning of the 20th century. Martin Heidegger, you may have heard of, is one of the most important so-called technology philosophers. But a lot of the texts that were, were made on um, technology were criticisms and criticisms as something bad. In the 19th century, the industry became mechanized. That means a lot of things that were done in production were starting to be done by machines. And the consequence of that was a high amount of unemployment, poverty, and social downfall. And that was, uh, I would say, instigated by technology. And thus, I would say quite naively, the technology philosophers said, okay, technology is something bad, which is something they do today still, because they still have not learned the lessons of the past. Well, technology has led to poverty, has led to pollution, has led to all sorts of problems, true. But also, Technology has at the time and today freed people up, freed people to do other things. Because in the beginning of the 20th century, you were either a factory worker or a farmer. Those two options in, in Europe. That's, that was where the two options you had. You did not have any other options. I mean, there were doctors and, and some kings and whatnot, but usually like for the vast majority of people, you were either a factory worker or a farmer. Now, since industry has been mechanized, there are way more different types of jobs. For instance, physical therapists did not exist at the time. There were doctors who could do some of what, they, what physical therapies did, uh, therapists did. But now you have professional physical therapists who only do that, which is something that did not exist. Today, we have in Germany at least about 40, 50,000 registered artists. And you didn't become an artist at that time, except for if you were extremely rich or had somebody who is extremely rich to, to pay for your living. Today, you have the opportunity to actually have a decent living and be an artist. And the decent living usually does not come from doing art. It's usually coming from having a very regular job. So, yeah, that's the other side of the technological revolutions and the consequences of it. One of the consequences is, for instance, somewhat affordable um, medicine, for instance which was unaffordable at the time and somewhat safe medicine, which was not really very safe. Just remember heroin was a cough medicine at the time. Heroin, <laughs> cough medicine, how great is that? Yeah, okay, um, you may see that, um, you may remember or have seen the 1936 film by Charlie Chaplin called Modern Times and in this iconic, um, scene where he was caught up by a machine and was um, torn through the workings in the workings of the machine it was a really funny scene, but it was a highly uh, well controversial and um, also um, impactful scene. And Charles Chaplin was definitely trying to criticize modern times. Gunther Anders, by the way, um, later wrote 
that humans were not a device besides devices, but a device for devices. Gunther Anders said that humans were a workpiece within machinery that has been built. And that's quite a powerful statement, I would say. Um, in German, we have that word, um, einen Computer bedienen, which means, in the correct translation, it means to use a computer. But in the German, um, German language, it really could be understood as serving a computer. Because bedienen means to serve. And I would like you to, to think about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, also, there was this German philosopher, Walter Benjamin, who um, was talking about in, in one of the books, uh, he was talking about artworks during the times of their technologic, technological reproducibility. And what Benjamin um, whined about, I would say, was that artwork would lose its aura, its deep value, because every artwork could be copied infinitely. He also talked about photography, and he, today you can take a picture and don't have to draw or paint a portrait anymore. That's something I often criticize that doomsayers um, that ultra pessimists often say. Um, the thing is, photography has not taken away something from art. It has added something. Photography has given the opportunity to do artwork by taking photographs. And it hasn't taken something away. Nobody keeps you from buying paint and start painting. I'm doing that. I have lots of oil paint and canvases and whatnot. And as I said, today we have more artists than ever, at least in Central Europe. I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Central Europe, we have more artists than we ever had. So, yeah, um, I like debunking the most favorite philosophers of many, um, well, many people. I don't want to, um, I mean, that would take hours if I would talk about this uh, like in very detail, but we, we must say that's, by the way, the idea of modeling. And that's why I'm talking about this in computational modeling. A reproduction is a model of something. A reproduction is not the reproduced thing. It doesn't want to be the reproduced thing. As I've told you, if you're in a um, different country and don't know the language there and they have you go to a restaurant wanting to eat something and if they have a menu with pictures well you can't eat the pictures but you can use the pictures to get to the real thing and um, maybe you would know that um, Franz Marc one of the great um, painters of uh, the 20th century uh, he had um, painted um, an artwork called Der Turm der Blauen Pferde, the Tower of Blue um, Horses. And it's gone, it's lost. But a photography of this still exists. And I would say, well, the photography is not the original, but it gives a hint or, or a shadow or um, an idea of what it once was. So in that itself, the photography of the original is worth something. I would say at least. And um, the ancient Greek painter Zeuxis, um, they say that he was able to, to paint grapes. I think I've talked about that already, but I'm saying it again. Well, Zeuxis should have, uh, is, it has been said that Zeuxis could um, paint grapes so realistically that 
um, birds would come and try to pick them. Plato, for instance, however, um, distinguishes between several um, layers of technology. Um, we know that we cannot eat painted grapes and we cannot make wine out of them. And you cannot sit on, on a painted chair, of course, and you cannot defend your city with a painted uh, sword. True. But they're not wrong in that. Well, a painted sword from the time gives you an idea on how it was constructed, how it looked like, how it was made. And I think that's a good thing. So the painting has a relationship to the original and that's important. From this perspective, I would say that there is also um, a philosophy of technology about ethics and technology. It was in 1955 when Rico Fignal published Les Machines à Penser, um, Thinking Machines. And that was before the first microprocessors did exist. Um, my, microprocessors were, I think, released in 1967 or something like that. So about uh, 10 years before that. And Cuffignal said that those thinking machines, those calculating machines, are similar to human thinking. So the brain would follow an analogous logic and the, uh, well, automaton, a mechanized one. And he said that, well, in, his, in itself, what's going on in the computer is just the rules of Aristotelic logic. And yeah, that's true, actually. Binary is ultimately founded on what Aristotle said about logic and thus about sensible thinking. So we could, we could say that maybe Kofinial has um, had a premonition of what we currently think about artificial intelligence. As you know, I will talk about artificial intelligence more next week, but he said, a cognitive system is a living or technological system which is able to distinguish between itself and its environment. No, sorry, that, that's what uh, Gotthard Günther wrote later. And I think that's uh, an interesting, um, interesting thought. So. Uh, Christoph Hubig, for instance, also said that, um, of course, every idea about humans is modeling. And what we do in this course is modeling, by the way. And often we use technology to make a model. And this way, if we would make an artificial intelligence, we could likely find more out more about human thinking by finding out about artificial thinking. So from this perspective, we also have a technology of philosophy. Next thing is um, natural sciences and philosophy. And you may know from, well, we certainly have heard of Werner Heisenberg, a great physician, uh, ph sorry, physicist, not physician physicist. And he published a nice little book about quantum theory and philosophy. And within it, he described the attempt of the philosopher named Grete Hermann to use the um, causal laws based on Kant's ideas to debunk the ideas of quantum theory. Um, the causal law says that every consequence has a, a root, has a, um, um, a cause, every consequence has a cause, and every cause has a consequence. I would say that's wrong. That is simply wrong. Every cause has a multitude of consequences, 
and every consequence has a multitude of several causes. That would be right. It's a web of causality. But anyway, Grete Hermann said that, well, quantum theory would violate this con concept. And she said, uh, quoted, she was quoted, how is it possible that quantum, mechan uh, that quantum mechanics uh, will uh, dissolve this law and still remain natural science? And he, he answered that uh, he, he didn't try to debunk um, Kantic philosophy at, at all, really, but that quantum theory is founded on ideas that Kant could never ever have happened. And Greta Hermann was very disappointed because she had hoped um, to either um, find a fatal flaw in Kant's philosophy or to debunk quantum theory. And in the end, neither is true. Kant's philosophy isn't <clears throat> incorrect. Quantum theory isn't incorrect. They're both incomplete. And that is something that we as scientists, we, we um, engineers or natural scientists or philosophers must keep in mind every theory we have, every theory we have is always incomplete. And that doesn't, doesn't mean when there is a new idea uh, that the old ideas are considered wrong. No, usually their um, region of <clears throat> being accurate or their region of accuracy shrinks a little. You know, Albert Einstein has not debunked Newtonian mechanics. I mean, US engineers know that most of the um, engineering applications still rely on Newtonian mechanics and it works. Doesn't mean that Newton is now wrong. It just isn't true all the time anymore. For instance, on very high speeds, on very low scales, or very small scales, or with very high masses, then, or very high densities, um, then Newtonian mechanics don't work anymore. Other than that, they work quite brilliantly, I would say. So from this perspective, I would say there is a philosophy of technology, definitely. I want to talk a little bit about what a philosophy of technology can do and what it should require. So if we remember that philosophy means the friendship to wisdom, that wisdom is a relationship or an attempt to relate to the truth and that truth is a logical decision whether or not a statement is correct or not, is accurate or not. Uh, then we could say that it is not even, well, it is unwise. It is unwise, maybe even naive, to do philosoph philosophical ideas and even judgments about technology without having at least a basic knowledge about technology. That's something I often encounter when I read or meet technology philosophers who have zero idea about the technology they're talking about. They're often saying things that are objectively wrong. That's why I say a technology philosopher doesn't have to be an engineer, but a technology philosopher has to have a basic idea of how technology works. And that's a very important thing. That does, doesn't mean that only engineers may think about technology philosophy. No, no, no. But it just means that um, those who talk about it should understand it, at least in the basic mechanisms, how they work. Otherwise, it's very foolish, whatever you say. So on the other hand, I think that an engineer has to know about philosophy a bit, basically. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be a philosopher, but understand basics of philosophy to do technology the right way with the right thought about the consequences. I think that's um, also a very important part of being an engineer. So <clears throat> there's another thing, technology as a biotope. 
that's by the way what I've written about in my latest book. Um, technology is a biotope. It's um, a living environment for humans, and it has been so since the Stone Ages. It's not something new, really. It's old. And the philosopher Bernhard Irgang gave a very good idea um, about what technology, technology philosophy could be and should be. Um, his book I'm referring to is called Posthumanus Menschsein, or it's post-human humanity. And he said that technology means for humans that the divisions between the living and the dead, animal and human, biological and technological, personal and non-personal, nature and culture, maid and maker, dissolve and change the view that humanity made of itself radically. And there was, he quotes Arnold Gehlen there and said that the um, imperfect being hum called human made a technological culture to, for itself and also compensated what it lacked naturally. And that's quite wise. And he said also, this would make the humans survival in a hostile environment well easier. And that's true. We do that all the time. I mean, look at me, I'm wearing glasses. I'm wearing glasses, otherwise I couldn't see well. I wear clothes. One reason of the clothes is that I would feel cold if I didn't. Otherwise, if I were naked, it would probably be a very weird lecture. <laughs> but um, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. But we wear clothes. We, we, we walk on shoes. We use tools to, to change the world to our liking. And that is, I would say, what distinguishes humans from animals the strongest, because humans are the only ones who are dependent on tools. And I would say that is true not only for people living in industrialized societies. Every human group I know about use tools. Every human does that. And there are um, animals who do use tools too. For instance, some apes use sticks to um, grab termites out of, out of woods, out of wood. Some birds take little pebbles and throw them at the houses of snails to, in order to eat them. Um, Japanese uh, macaques and uh, bonobos, some bonobos take potatoes and throw them in, the, in salt water because they taste better. So yeah, um, animals, some animals at least. It's a good question. If I think uh, making so much use of tools makes us too dependent on them and we discourage the development of other abilities, difficult question, I would say it has been our custom forever. And let's say I would be unable to survive in the desert I would be unable to survive in the steppes of uh, Siberia. I would be not able to survive in Antarctica and Greenland. But we have people who are in Eastern Africa, for instance, we have the Maasai people who are a quite able to thrive and survive in steppes and be herds and live a good life. We have the Tuva people in Siberia and Mongolia who um, live in extremely cold temperatures, but they survive and thrive. We also have the Inuit peoples who live in Greenland and, and Antarctica, not Antarctica, Antarctica. And they survive and thrive there, but also they use tools. But yeah, the fact that I live in uh, Central Europe in a 
concrete house and can call somebody to bring me a pizza anytime, I think that has an impact on my abilities. However, I would say we would be able to learn these abilities if we needed them. I would say that the old ways, like the people in Stone Ages have lived, aren't really gone. We would learn them again, if necessary. We would learn the, those skills and abilities again, if necessary, and if somebody teaches us. And I believe there are still both historical scientists who have those skills, who know those skills. And also there are so many, still so many civilizations of people who at least remember the old lifestyle. And I think maybe we discourage the development of other abilities, yes, but we also encourage the de de development of abilities that we may, may not have um, needed otherwise. And I would say that's not neither something good nor bad, it just is. Somebody who would like to have um, a life more closer to nature can. It is possible those people, those civilizations still exist. I mean, they're not in the Stone Ages. They, they have radios and televisions. The Tuva people, for instance, have generators and they have television and they have uh, radios and, and what and what not. But they live a lot closer. That those who have the traditional, still follow the traditional lifestyle, they still know how to survive in the Mongolian steppe, which is not quite easy. I would die there in like two days. They would not, and they can live there. And if necessary, I think they could teach us, like us by people like me, who would die in two days. <laughs> they could teach us. I, I often thought about that quite a long time because I know Galzan Chinak. Galzan Chinak is um, a shaman of the Tuva people, and um, he's um, also, also an author, and uh, Galzan Chinak writes down the old history and the old stories of his people, and he publishes them in German, interestingly, in Germany and in the German language and in Mongolian language. Because uh, when he was a young boy, um, he got a, um, got a scholarship to study in the former German De uh, Democratic Republic, which was a Soviet puppet state, and so was Mongolia. So <clears throat> he went to, 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 to the German De Democratic Republic, and which was not democratic, by the way, mind you. But um, he studied there. Now he writes uh, very, very nice books about the stories of his people. And I often thought about, why not ask if I could live with uh, them for a year or so? Why not? I mean, it's not as comfortable as my life here, but maybe it's good for me. Maybe it's not a bad idea to do that for once. This thought has been in my mind for, for years now. Ah, by the way, um, there is another techno philosophy named Klaus Erlach, who um, in his dissertation um, wrote that about the technotopia, which is at least since antiquity, an integral part of human life. So from this perspective, there also is a um, philosophy of technology. Yeah, now to look into the future prognosis. Hmm. You may have heard of the Oracle of Delphi in uh, Greek antiquity. And the Oracle of Delphi was a center for prophecies. It was sacrosanct. That means that nobody may fight and continue wars on the grounds of Delphi. Uh, you may have heard that the Greek city-states often, very often, were at war with each other, like most famously the Athenians and the Spartans who fought with each other like all the time, but also other uh, Greek city-states did that. But the Oracle of mm -hmm. Delphi was one of the sacrosanct centers and 
there, people of all of the Greek world, and sometimes even uh, other people, could ask the god Apollon for, well, for advice and for prophecies. And for that, those, the patrons of the oracle had to ask or post, post their questions in writing before the oracle was asked. Because, that, well, one of the reasons was that only on certain days, Apollon could answer questions. Um, usually it was um, only once a year uh, on Apollon's birthday. Later, it was every th seventh day of the month. And in the summer, sometimes uh, also in um, subsequent days of the seven days of the month. Sometimes also if the offerings to Apollon were very great and valuable, Apollo would be prepared to answer questions on other days too. And the Lydian king Croesus is said to have asked whether or not he could attack the Persian king Kairos. And Apollon answered, Croesus will, when he crosses the Halis, destroy a great empire. Halis is a, um, uh, is a river that was the border between Persia and, and Gre the Greek lands, uh, which is now found in present day Turkey. So Croesus will, crossing the Halis, destroy a great empire. Um, so Croesus did attack Kairos and Apollon's prophecy was correct. Indeed, a great empire was destroyed and that empire was Lydia, Croesus's land. So yeah, Apollon was right. <laughs> so I, I cannot say if it really was uh, Apollon that said these things. I cannot say for sure that it was, well, Apollon did not speak himself because he didn't physically come down from Mount Olympus, but his priestess, Pythia, who was named by Python, by the way, uh, Python, um, the great snake that was um, destroyed by Apollon and well, Pythia was named after this um, serpent, uh, and he was the priestess. Uh, she was the priestess of um, Apollon. Uh, by the way, Pythia is not an is not a, a name; it's a title. There were like lots of Pythias, um, <clears throat> and well, Pythia said these things, or she said something, and only the priests. The prophetes were allowed to hear what she said, and they translated that. And it's now possible that really Apollon gave um, the Pythia something, uh, gave an answer, and the prophetess um, uh, interpreted it correctly. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that remember, all the patrons, all the people who asked the uh, Oracle had to submit their questions in writing. So maybe the pro prophetess, the priests, just knew what everybody was up to. They knew what Persia was up to. They knew what all the Greeks were up to. And then they could figure what would happen. To be a little bit of heretical, maybe it's just because they were the Facebook of their time, maybe. So anyway, what I was trying to say, why should you talk about technology and have some idea about technology is, yeah, well, the more basics and background and fundamentals you know, the better your descriptions can be. And I've tried this. Uh, there was the course Robot Design, Theory, Practice, Philosophy, where I talked about techno philosophy, but also made robots with the students. They had um, lectures and exercises just like you did, but they also had built robots and then talked about techno philosophy. And it was interesting to see that 
a lot of students change their minds really about technology after having built robots. We realized that, or a lot of students seem to have realized that um, knowing about how technology works or how about the basics of technology work is really helpful to talk about it philosophically, philosophically. And yeah, um, we also discussed, for instance, things like um, for like some time ago, an employee of Tesla died while testing an, an autonomous car. And then, as expected, everybody started to say, oh, they're not as safe. Oh, God, we shouldn't do. Should we really do autonomous driving? Should we really do? OK, it's tragic that this man died, definitely. But there is no such thing as perfect security and perfect safety. There is no such thing. And yes, if all the cars are autonomous, we will still have some, um, some accidents and deaths. But an autonomous car, if it has the right sensors, can see people, pedestrians and bicyclists through concrete walls. An autonomous car can tell other autonomous car in the vicinity of danger and warn them. An autonomous car will never drive drunk. An autonomous car, if made properly, will never go faster than it's allowed to. So a lot of the reasons why we have accidents are just gone if we drive or if we have our uh, cars drive autonomously they're just gone it doesn't mean that there will be no danger at all still there will be danger there, there, there will be deaths unfortunately but since one of the major factors in um tragic accidents and deaths and and, and injury in accidents is gone I suspect we will have a lot less than we have now. And that is something I'm completely sure of. Also, since um, the cars can, or if made well, can communicate with, with each other, they can also negotiate and prevent traffic jams and thus also make um, the transport Supporting of goods and people much more energy efficient. We will have to think about that too. Yeah, that's essentially what I said in this text. So every autonomous car knows the position of every other autonomous car in the vicinity. So nobody's ever surprised. Um, nobody's ever, again, nobody's ever drunk and if they see, if one um, autonomous car sees, say, children playing on the streets, which happens, it can warn all the other cars, and say, careful, there are kids on the street, go slowly or avoid this, this street or whatever. So yeah, um, but just saying one person has died, which is bad, which is terrible, and then Concluding that we shouldn't do autonomous cars is just foolish. It's really foolish because, well, we have human flight and um, the first, well, the first planes were death traps. They really were. The first planes were death traps. And accidents happened often and were deadly. Now, flying with a plane Maybe bad for the environment, yeah, okay, I'll give you that. But it also allows you to find colleagues and friends from all over the world. I mean, I'm, I have um, taught courses in, in, uh, at our university for nine years now, and I've met people from all over the world, which would not have been possible without planes, or, well, very unlikely. Because you can go to a faraway place, and come back safely with an extremely low risk of uh, getting hurt that way. So yeah, we have to take that into account too. 
And I must say, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the fact that I can meet people from everywhere quite easily. And that's because some brave people went into planes knowing that they wasn't really sure if they would reach their destination alive. And now, yeah, planes are not perfectly safe. We always, every other year or so, we hear, hear about a problem that happened, yes. But all in all, I would say it's a good thing. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And that's, think back to the Oracle of Delphi idea. Maybe it wasn't Apollon who could predict things like um, Kreuzos getting uh, his butt kicked by <laughs> Kairos. Um, maybe it's just because they knew everything. The prophetess knew everything. And that same mechanism is something that I'm sure we will see in cars, because if the car knows everything, it knows all of the other cars, it knows all of the bicyclists and pedestrians and, and, and construction sites and whatnot, then it's less likely, far less likely, um, that problem, a big problem will happen. Yeah, so from this situation, I would say we also have uh, a philosophy of the technology. Now, prosthetics, I've start, started with um, um, prosthetics before. We use prosthetics all the time, humans do. And I told you, well, birds, some birds pick, uh, you pick uh, pebbles and stones, little small stones to open uh, snail houses. Um, gorillas use sticks to uh, look for, for ants and termites and some apes and, and monkeys use um, or throw potatoes and other fruit and, and, and other um, um, root uh, fruits and whatnot in um, salty water to, to um, well, make them taste better. The dolphins um, also use sponges, like live sponges, cruelly, um, to protect their noses when they dig for edible things in the, on the sea ground. It's not a nice thing to do, uh, sponges are animals, uh, but they do that. But we humans use walking sticks if we have an injured leg or if we are just old. Um, we use ground lenses, ground and polished lenses to see better, especially if we have um, seeing deficits such as myself. Um, we also make nuclear weapons to threaten others. I already know that ex escalated quickly, but it's true. So I'm, I'm not sure if humans are really the only ones who could realize a technological problem and, and think about um, a solution to a technological problem. But to me, it's without doubt that only humans have specialized in finding technological solutions to problems and to use technology to um, deal with environmental issues. We know that the people in the stone ages, they really, they usually didn't live in caves, by the way. Most of them built little huts. They used wood and um, tar to build huts. It depends a little bit on where they lived and what they found, but they would build huts. And those huts would make it easier to pr be protected from the wind. They domesticated fire to have it, well, to, to stave off the cold. They would hunt animals and use their skin, their fur to make clothes. So, they specialized already on making technology. And I think it's only humans who specialize in that. Anyway, uh, philosophy of technology has to also ask questions about what questions are to be asked, about the consequences, the righteousness, rightfulness of 
the human tendency to to change nature in a way that it's well safer and more comfortable for humans so it's a lot less easy to find answers to that than it seems in the beginning i have colleagues who just start with technology is bad get rid of technology and we will all be fine no you will not no you will not um, and if you don't believe me go to greenland and ask the people there if they know some friends or relatives who have the traditional inuit lifestyle ask around then live with them for a year or two they come back and tell me that technology is a bad thing and i don't get me wrong i don't do not look down on those people i look up to them i admire them i admire the way that they could survive and thrive and have a good life in an environment that I would simply die within days. I look up to them and I respect them for that. Don't misquote me here, please. Somebody asked, I think the difference between us and the people from the Stone Ages is that now many people want to create and sell products that you don't really need, or even worse, creating guns and sell them to make profit themselves. I would, in that sense, uh, disagree with that. Because, first of all, guns. Hmm. I often hear people say that wars get worse, suffering gets worse. No, false. There's Guido Mingus, who um, wrote for the Spiegel, um, wrote several articles on that, and you can check what he says uh, with the numbers. No. Wars did exist in the Stone Ages. Definitely, 100%, they did exist. And they were not wars really for resources. They were wars about the destruction of the other group. So it wasn't like conquering territory and maybe um taking their stuff it was about destroying the other ones and now well we had um the world war ii which was from the nazi side um a war to destroy yes i'm not denying that but since then wars are really not about destroying an, an, an enemy in some regions there are but they are more for getting the stuff the others have. And that is another thing. And creating weapons, let's say guns is one of kind of weapons, but creating weapons was an industry long, long before agriculture has been, has been created. Um, creating terrible weapons to very gruesomely and cruelly kill other people have been made in the Stone Ages. They were not as effective as, well, nuclear weapons today, true. But um, I would ask you if, like, um, uh, it's quite likely that a lot of you don't believe me. I personally know um, a, a guy who used to, who is a retired, um, um, member of the German military and um, he told me about how combat is done today combat is done is not about killing the others I mean it's a consequence of it it sometimes is um, yeah it's a consequence of it but it's not the means it's a difficult topic and we can we can talk about this uh, at length, but um, maybe that would, would go a little bit too far from here. But yeah, um, many people want to make and sell you products that you don't really need. Um, well, that this does happen, definitely. But luxury, it's called that luxury. And luxury goods 
are at least ancient. I'm not sure if luxury goods existed in the Stone Ages, but in ancient times, luxury did, did exist. The only difference now is that a huge portion of the, uni of, of the people in the world, as strange as this may sound for you, can afford luxury. I know a lot of people, uh, I know especially when I'm at phil philosophical um, conferences, a lot of people start to um, condescendingly laugh at me when I say that. But if you consider anything that's not di directly vital to your survival, a luxury, I would say the vast amount of us, at least in Europe, I don't know where it is in other places, but at least in Europe has a lot of luxury. So yeah, part of the consequences of present times since antiquity of present times is that a lot more people have access to luxury than they used to have. We know luxurious items from ancient Egypt and the old kingdoms, yes, but those luxury items were only owned by very, either by the pharaoh, pharaohs and the high um, officials, and not by pretty much any, anybody else, yes. Um, and today we have more access to luxury, that's true. And I've traveled um, to many places in the world, and I saw luxury everywhere. And that certainly wasn't true in antiquity. That's, that's correct. Okay, um, ah, yeah, my favorite word in Greek philosophy is no the seauton. Um, it means know thyself. Now, about um, the development of artificial intelligence, it, it's, it's not possible to find universal definitions for terms like intelligence or for, for um, consciousness. Those are difficult difficult concepts. And as far as I'm aware, there is no universally accepted definitions for any of those terms. But just like before, I allow myself to find a working definition. About working definitions, often I have discussions with philosophers who just want to discuss the terms and not the topic. But then I say, no, if we discuss a topic, we use working definitions. And if we want to discuss a word, that's a different discussion. So I'm saying this is my working definition for my argument right now. And if somebody wants to discuss the terminology, that's a different thing. Because unfortunately, without working definitions, many philosophical discussions, in my experience at least, devolve into discussions on the meanings of words instead of addressing a certain topic. And that's why I do this very heretical thing. So I'm, I'm based, loosely based on um, Bernhard Irgang and say that consciousness is the ability to realize one's own existence. That's what I, as a working definition, would call um, consciousness. And as the same, in the same manner, um, a working definitions for, uh, definition for intelligence would be, for my argumentation, the ability to react to unpredicted events without having been programmed to react and to learn from them. So intelligence would be the ability to react to something I did not expect without having been taught before how to react. That's what I would call intelligence for this working definition, uh, as a work, working definition for this argumentation. I would say that th there currently is no, at least not known to me, any, there is not any architecture, any topology, any calculating topology, any computer to, that could reproduce a natural nervous system of the complexity of the humans. There is no architecture, no computer that can accurately do that. So a natural nervous system has 
a lot of neurons that have a lot of interconnections between each other and they transmit information through those connections. And neural, neural uh, processes in nature work asynchronous, while a computer, generally speaking, is a, is a sequential calculator. I mean, depending on what model you have, you may have one processor core or two or seven or, uh, or eight or how many, whatever. I have eight, um, other computers have um, 12 or 16. Most generally have four or have a, around four. But in general, every core of that is a sequential computer. I know about hyperthreading and I know about, uh, yeah, about hyperthreading, but in general, there is one, one uh, command and then it uh, executes the next command and then the next command and then the next command and then the next command. That's not how a natural nervous system works. A natural, in a natural nervous system, everything works well, roughly at the same time and asynchronously. That means your senses are, by the way, almost always active. They're also active while you're asleep. Your senses are always active, but your mind may not realize it. You may only feel your left pinky toe when you've just stubbed it at a tree leg. Or you may only feel your left pinky toe if you think about it and li literally access it. But most of the time you don't feel your left pinky toe because as, as long as it's okay, if it's injured, you'll feel the pain. But if it's okay, you just, you just don't really feel it in that usually. And that's because, well, the human mind just ignores information that's supposed to be, um, that's not considered relevant right now. There's also a, a reason why a lot of people cannot sleep well in smoky rooms. Because that's, well, why, um, because your, well, Stone Age, still Stone Age inspired brain thinks that your village is burning and you should wake up. So all of your senses always work all of the time, except if you have brain damage or are in a coma or are um, in some very unusual state. And your brain really never sh completely shuts down. It, if you sleep, you're in a different operating mode, but you're not, it's not out. It's not just shut down. Your brain always works from the moment, but well, from before you're born until you die. So that is something as far as I know that cannot be recreated currently with technological means. As far as I can tell, there is no technology right now to do that. Maybe there will be, I don't know, but there likely isn't something like that anytime soon. Artificial neural networks, try to recreate that. Those of you have, who have joined the extra session um, after Christmas have had a little bit of an introduction into that. If you, if you um, remember, well, artificial neural networks are models, again, they're not recreation, recreations of natural, um, natural neural networks, but they model aspects of what they are and what they do. And artificial neural networks sometimes can even be better in some ways than human um, neural networks. But I don't see it. Um, I don't see the creation of a human-like artificial neural network anytime soon, because we simply don't have the architecture for that yet. But we'll see. It's not long ago that people thought that human flight was impossible. Um, we'll see. So yeah, um, about technology philosophy, that was a 
discussion, but that was essentially a technological, philosophical, philosophical uh, discussion idea. Um, yeah, Greek antiquity, um, Greek philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy knew the well. Even I would always almost call it the mantra: it's "Noti, noti se auton." It means "Know thyself," and that's why I call. What I, why I defined my work, why, why I made the working definition of the um, term consciousness that way. If consciousness is the ability to, to, under, to realize its own existence, that's the connection to the ancient Greek philosophy. Because they say that what you need to know is know yourself. That's like the first thing you need to know if you want to become a philosopher. And that's hard. That's really hard. So we have another task for the philosophy of technology and both an artificial and a natural consciousness, if we can call it that, must be told or taught, I would say taught, to know what to do and what not to do. I can explain to you how, how, how this is being done. Um, I've done so between uh, after Christmas for those who, who were there, but that's not a, not a simple answer. There's no simple answer to that. Um, but if there is an entity, be they na natural or technical, uh, technological, that is able to realize its own existence and know itself and is able to to react to new situations without prior programming, then it's necessary to, to ask, wait a second, not what can it do, what should it do? Um, what should it not do? What to do when whatever? Not only ask what is the duty of this system I've just described, but also what are its rights? What rights does it have? We don't have such a system yet, but we should ask ourselves that now, because when it exists, it's gonna to be too late to start thinking about that. So if we have uh, an entity that can realize its own existence and interact and, and react without prior programming, what are its rights? It's important. And what is, can you just shut down such a thing? I mean, we have animal rights, we have human rights. Sometimes they are being violated and that's wrong. It's wrong to violate human rights, definitely. It's always wrong, it always has been wrong. But if we have a technological system that can do the same things that a natural human consciousness can, we have to already have an answer to this question. What rights does it have? Do we extend human rights to these kinds of things, these kinds of entities? We shouldn't even call them things yet uh, anymore. Um, you know, I love video games. Um, one of the greatest video games on that topic is uh, Detroit Become Human. They don't pay me for advertising it. They should, but they don't. Try looking at Detroit Become Human. That is the most incredible story on that question. Because in that, it's a, so, so to speak, hard science fiction, like in the near future. And in this game, there are androids that are almost indistinguishable from humans. Of course, this game or this game's story quotes the old Blade Runner films and they quote the old, um, the old um, literature on these questions. Of course, it's not like entirely new, but it's a very, very good um, discussion on how to, how to treat your androids. It's heartbreaking in parts. And in this game, 
um, the way the story goes really depends on your own decisions. You have to ask yourself many times how to behave and how to react and what to do. And, and that's it's something I can only recommend you do. Or um, if you, you have, an, I think in Netflix, we have Star Trek Next Generation. There's this episode in two, uh, yeah, they touched this topic in two episodes of Black Mirror. I haven't seen that yet. It's on my list, but I haven't seen Black Mirror yet. Okay, anyway, um, we have to ask also what rights should these systems have? And that is the question of technology philosophy. And of course, similar, um, similar questions are asked in the Matrix. Uh, likely uh, most of you know the Matrix series. There's a new one ha that has come out and I'm waiting until it comes to, um, to, to streaming services. Um, but if you like the Matrix movies, maybe you have seen um, the um, Animatrix series. Um, Animatrix was a, a sort of a fan made short film series. But the Machowskis who made the Matrix, they they support that, and in the it's within the lore of of the of the Matrix uh, stories, and in Animatrix um, there's also so to speak a prequel how it came to the war between humans and machines, and how the machines were treated by humans. That's an interesting question, um, an interesting uh, film, and also those don't sponsor me, also those should. But anyway, nobody sponsors me. Anyway, and another series I would strongly suggest um, in that kind of ballpark is Westworld. Um, it's um, a series that was um, is based on a um, on a film in the from the nineteen sixties, I think. Um, it's also very good. So anyway, a philosophy. What I was trying to say: a philosophy of technology should ask these questions and they should ask um, them now before it's too late and we have those. There's also a movie, I think, Chappie, in which they are able to create consciousness in a robot. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, that, there's there are a lot of great uh, films. I'm gonna look it up, maybe I can watch it. Yeah, um, in the end, a, a philosophy of technology needs to realize that technology is made, is made by people. And an engineer should also keep in mind that technology is supposed to be made for people. And thank you for listening. That was all I wanted to tell you today.